You and I don't live in a dog-forgive-dog dog world. We live in a dog-eat-dog dog world. You've got to read a book called The Sunflower by Simon Weisenthal, who survived the Nazi concentration camp. And in the book, The Sunflower, Simon Weisenthal struggles with the issue. How can Jewish people forgive Nazis for what they have done? And the reason that that's such a relevant question is because of what's going on in Yugoslavia. Bosnian and Serbs and Croats, ethnic cleansing. The reason that's such a relevant question is because of ethnic cleansing in Africa. I mean, if you slaughtered my grandma and grandpa, why shouldn't I slaughter you? Why should I forgive you? That's irrational. Because if I forgive you, then you still might come and slaughter me. If you slaughtered my grandpa and grandma, or if your grandma and grandpa slaughtered my grandma and grandpa, I better pull the trigger and blow you away real fast. That's rational. Forgiveness is irrational. Forgiveness is stupid. Forgiveness makes no sense. And yet Jesus Christ revealed that God forgives, but he doesn't forgive by ignoring his justice. That's why the cross of Christ is so central in the gospel. The Gospels are not biographies. They don't give you a complete view of the life of Christ. The Gospels have an incredible fascination with the cross of Christ. And it's right there at the cross that a just, holy God absorbs in his body the penalty that we deserve for our wrongdoing, thereby offering us the option of forgiveness. And forgiveness is crazy, forgiveness is irrational, and forgiveness is stupid. And yet, if you think about it, it's the only way that you and I as human beings are going to be able to have a deep relationship. Because if you and I begin a relationship, at some point I'm going to hurt you. And in order for our relationship to continue, if you don't forgive me, our relationship will be condemned to a superficial relationship. So that's what the cross of Christ is all about. The justice of God and the forgiveness of God coming together. someone then you have a superficial relationship then why is forgiveness stupid? Forgiveness sounds practical in that sense. Forgiveness is stupid because when you forgive someone and you don't hurt them it's very very possible that when they're tempted to go at you again they're not going to have that appropriate fear of the consequences. See if you hurt me and I pull out a knife and stick it in you. That's a strong motivating factor for you not to behave that way towards me again. But if you hurt me and I forgive you, well, maybe next time you're tempted to hurt me again, you just say, well, he forgave me the first time, maybe he'll forgive me a second time. You know, it's a normal part of human, of human behavior toward one another. It's not, it's not this you know, stupid thing that God has to come along and, and, uh, and introduce into the world. No, the, the question the woman asked was, how can God be just and also forgiving at the same time? That's the question she asked. Fine. Well, then don't relate it to the previous question. Ask your own unique question. Well, well no, that was what you said. I mean, does something mean something different? When you say it in the context of a different question, I mean, you said the thing. You said the statement, um, you know, forgiveness is stupid. Now, do you not mean that if I'm talking about, you know, practical, you know, human behavior? I mean, do you, do you, not, do you deny that? When talking forgiveness is irrational. That's my statement. Forgiveness is irrational. Forgiveness is stupid. Forgiveness doesn't make sense. What does make sense is revenge. If you stick me, I'm going to stick you. Why? Because I want to teach you. Don't treat me that way. Well, Reve revenge is irrational. Revenge is self-defeating. Forgiveness is progressive. It teaches people to progress and to go on. I'm confused. I, I don't see how you can say that. Well, then why don't we all always forgive? We're not perfect. Good. Well, if morality is relative, why would you view forgiveness as being so important? My point is, God is a forgiving God, and God has given you and me the ability to love. And love is not a biological drive. Love goes beyond my biological drive. Love is a free decision that I make to care for someone not expecting a reward in return. 
And forgiveness is me saying, you know, you really hurt me. I am giving up my right to hurt you in return, and I'm going to release you from that. I'm going to forgive you. And that's, that's radical. But that's exactly what God has done in Jesus Christ, and that's exactly what Christ calls us to do. You look at a man like Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan understands, you white Christian racists have really hurt my people. And you listen to the man, and you listen to the understandable hatred. I have the utmost respect for my African-American brothers and sisters who have not allowed the racist attitudes of white Christians to turn them off to the true Jesus Christ who didn't have a racist bone in their body. But that is difficult. And I understand Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan is very clear in his thinking. Your grandparents, you white folks, they enslaved my people. And if you think I'm going to forgive you, if you think I'm going to trust you, you're an idiot. I don't have any reason to trust you white folks. And I'm going to get you for it. You look at a man like Dr. Martin Luther King, on the other hand, and there you see the grace of God, the love of Christ being fleshed out in his life in an incredible way that demands respect. But I understand Louis Farrakhan. He makes a lot of sense to me. I would like to know if you think that morality requires your religion. No, morality does not depend upon Jesus Christ. Then what does your religion, why, why do we need your religion then? If it's not for morality, if we do not need your religion to care for each other and to conduct ourselves morally in life in regards with each other, then what do we need your religion for? Two things. First of all, Jesus claimed to be God, revealing himself in a way that you and I can understand, and he promised that you and I can live in a relationship with God if we ask him for forgiveness for the wrong that we have done. Secondly, Jesus promised that if we put our faith in him, he would give us the power to live a better life, more moral life with his help than we can on our own, and he promised us eternal life in heaven. There have been philosophers throughout the ages who have offered that if we followed their ideas, we would conduct ourselves in a morally superior society. Why does your religion provide anything different? The evidence is that the grave of Adam Smith is full. The grave of Friedrich Nietzsche is full. The grave of Sartre and Camus is full. The grave of Confucius, Mohammed, Zoroaster is full. No, the grave of Jesus Christ is empty. It is his historical resurrection from the dead that puts Christ apart as unique, as distinct, as different. You said regardless, of that, come from -life. regardless of that, why does that give us a need for your religion? Well, the resurrection of Christ is weighty evidence that Jesus was not blowing smoke, he was speaking the truth. Um, but still, that doesn't answer my question. Why does that mean we need your religion? You he don't made, need my religion, you need Jesus just, Christ. Because he's God in human form, who loves you, who offers you forgiveness and eternal life. See, you don't need my religion. But you do many, need Jesus Christ. There have been many thinkers and writers throughout the ages who have offered the same thing to men, one, from one man to each other, without the need for the insertion of a superior being such as a god. I don't, I'm not offended by the idea of a god. What I am offended by is the idea that you have the right to tell us whether or not we can be accepted by God, because that gives you followers. That I gives don't you have that right. Power. I'm not standing out here saying, come with me. C come with me. Jo join my group. I'm not standing out here saying, money, please. Give me your money for me. No. Are, Instead, I'm out mother. here as a mailman, you are delivering mother. the mail of Jesus. You I am pointing mother. you to Jesus Christ. I'm not pointing you to my church or my group. I'm not saying join me. I'm not no, saying that. What you are I saying, am saying is that first of all, Let me say what I'm soul. saying, okay? I'll let you say what you say, and you let me say what I say. What I am saying is, the evidence is that you can study for yourself in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that Jesus is reliable. You don't take it from me. You go back, you leave right now, don't listen to me say another thing. Go back and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for yourself and ask yourself, does the evidence point to Jesus being reliable or does it not? And if the evidence is he's not reliable, trash him. If the evidence is he is reliable, put your faith in him. That's all I'm saying. What I think you have been saying is that men, men have a soul. You've been seeking as much as, as humanly possible to tell us that there is a soul that we all have. However, I believe the only reason that's important to you is so that you can then tell us how we can keep our soul and we don't put it in jeopardy. And I think that that gives you a power that you don't need to have.
fine. But it was Jesus who said in Mark chapter 8, what does it profit a man or a woman if they gain the whole world but lose their soul? So I'm not making this stuff up to jerk people around or manipulate people. It was Jesus who said, what does it profit a man or a woman if they gain the whole world, have the American dream, the American pie, and everything else, but lose their soul? And obviously the answer to that question is they don't gain anything. He knows what's going to happen in the future. He knows every event that's going to happen. But in my philosophy class, they told us that if God has determined everything that's going to happen, therefore how do we have free will? And I had no answer for that question. Okay, great question. I think it's real clear that the Bible insists that God does not determine everything that happens. God allows things to happen, but God does not determine it. You will not find fatalism or determinism in the Bible. I, as a follower of Christ, if I fall down these stairs, do not pick myself up at the bottom and say, phew, I'm glad that's over. No. If I fall down these stairs, I pick myself at the, up at the bottom and say, hey, dummy, don't do that again. Watch, be more careful. In other words, I didn't have to fall down the stairs because God predetermined it. I fell down the stairs because I tripped and fell. Be more careful, Cliff. Now, what do we mean? We mean this. A professor at Northwestern University stepped out of the crowd and said, I can prove to you, Cliff, that your God doesn't exist. I said, really? Please do it. He said, it's real simple. You believe God's all-powerful, and you believe he's all-loving. Suffering exists. It's impossible if God is all-powerful and if God is all-loving for suffering to exist. I said, sir, wait a second. You... You're ignoring one possibility. It is totally possible for an all-powerful God to choose to partially limit his power by creating us free. If an all-powerful God chooses to create me free, it means God is partially limiting his power by giving me freedom, and I can go out and do evil. That's not God doing the evil. It's me doing the evil. The Allies had the power a few years ago to flatten Baghdad. They chose to limit their power, not storm into Baghdad. But they had the power to. They had all the guns, all the planes, they could have raised the place, leveled it. Similarly, God has the power to do whatever God wants. But the Bible insists that God has created us with a soul, with a free will, which means God has put us in a position of responsibility. That's why there's a day of judgment. If we didn't have free will, why would there be a day of judgment? The reason there's a day of judgment is because God has given us a free will. He holds us responsible for the decisions that we make in this life. Does that make any sense? Thanks. Yes, sir. Um, but if God is all... Do you say that God is omniscient also, that he is all-knowing? Or, I mean, do you, is that part of God? If God knew beforehand that you were going to fall down those stairs... Like a hundred years ago, if God knew that Cliff was going to fall down right. those stairs, right. then whether you thought that you had a choice in falling down those stairs or not, like if you cho chose to fall down those stairs, if you chose to eat lunch today and God knew you were going to eat lunch, whether you thought you had a choice or not, you didn't because God knew it was going to happen a hundred years ago. So I don't see where the choice or the free will falls down. Great point. Happen. That's a great point. Real simple. There are two ways of viewing God's omniscience. One way is this. God writes on a piece of paper what time I'm going to eat lunch today. Locks the piece of paper in a vault. And I have no choice. I'm going to eat lunch at the time on that piece of paper. That's determinism. But there's another way of viewing God's omniscience, and it's this way. Because of God's perspective outside of the dimension of time, which is obviously one of the Bible's main points, that God is eternal. He doesn't have a birthday and a death day. Because of his perspective outside of time, God is in a position to see tomorrow, today. Taking this metaphor further into religion, saying that religion is maybe different religions are different personalities, are different ways of handling circumstances that, that, were, that were brought about during different time periods and had different needs in those different time periods, but that at the same time, those were brought about through souls which are a part of God or that are, even if they're a creation of God, they're still non-material and because they're a creation of God, a part of God. So how does that make any one particular religion right 
for everybody except for the people at those specific times, whether it be when they were created or today, for whatever reason, as just a way of handling the word world based on their concerns, their needs, their insecurities. I don't understand how it can be. I mean, I mean, I guess you can go back and say, well, Christ died on a cross for our sins, you know, and you know that's why we need him. But that just seems to me that it's a psychological need to have somebody else um, say that you're okay, that you're right in a sense that that if if you believe that you're a sinner, then you know that okay, now I'm okay because someone else saved me. All right, well, here's my basic problem with monism, the idea that we all are part of God. My basic problem is in the area of ethics. If he is part of God, and if I am part of God, I haul back and slap him in the face. What just happened? Part of God, exactly, I just hit myself, precisely. Part of God just hit part of God. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what part of God chose to do to another part of God. You see, you wipe out the basis for the understanding of right and wrong, because everything is part of God. Gandhi got his understanding that the caste system in India was wrong, not from the Vedas and Upanishads and Bhagavad Gita. Gandhi got his understanding that the caste system in India was wrong from the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus teaches This is not part of God, and this is not part of God. This is a human being with dignity created in the image of God. This is a human being created in the image of God with dignity. And if I haul back and rake his face, that is unjust, it's dehumanizing, it is absolutely evil. And that's why Gandhi fought against the caste system. Not because he bought into, well, everything's part of God and everyone's part of God. Because then you, you, you you have no basis for understanding what is right, what is wrong, and why. This gentleman asks... What do you think about abortion? How do you think through the issue? First point, the Bible never mentions the word abortion. You'll never find that word anywhere in the Bible. Second point, the Bible does insist that human life has an innate dignity. Human life is not an accident. Human life has been created by God for a purpose, to love God and to love others. Because life has a purpose, life has significance, life has dignity. I always have a very sad feeling when I hear an atheist say to me, well, there is no God, Cliff, but life has value and significance. And I say, really? Why? And they say to me, because we attach significance to our lives. Well, big whoop. If I stand out here and say, I am the greatest, I am the greatest, if I attach that I am the greatest to myself, so what? It doesn't make me the greatest. And just because I attach significance to my life or to your life doesn't, in reality, give me significance. If in reality you're a hunk of primordial slime evolved to a higher order, then that's what you are, a good-looking hunk of primordial slime. You don't have any dignity. You don't have innate value. You're a cosmic accident. So face reality. The Bible says no. Jesus insists you're not a hunk of primordial slime evolved to a higher order. You're a human being created by God for a purpose. That is why every human being has an innate value and dignity. That is why murder is wrong. And one of the Ten Commandments is, thou shalt not murder. Now, then obviously the question becomes, is abortion murder, or is abortion simply removing excess skin from a woman's body? If abortion is removing excess skin from a woman's body, there's obviously nothing wrong with it. We all remove excess skin from our body on a regular basis. We trim our fingernails, cut our hair, I peel calluses off my feet from playing basketball. So we all remove excess skin from our body, and there's obviously nothing wrong with that. But if abortion is terminating a human life based on inconvenience, based on selfishness, then obviously, and I trust we all would agree, abortion is murder. It's wrong. So obviously, that forces us to work through the issue, when does human life begin? And that's obviously where people disagree. Now, here's how I work through the issue. If a, bed li- if a body lying on a bed in an intensive care unit in any major hospital in the United States has brain activity and heartbeat, doctors and nurses are legally, medically, ethically responsible to do everything within their power to sustain that life. Brain activity and heartbeat, fine. Between four to six weeks after conception, the quote little piece of skin in a woman's womb, unquote, has brain activity and heartbeat. I would hope, just based on that very simple definition of human life as having brain activity and heartbeat, that we would all agree 
that between four to six weeks, we're talking about a human life in a woman's womb because of the existence of brain activity and heartbeat. Well, what about before six to eight weeks? Is it simply a hunk of skin or is it a human life? My thinking is simple. Is there any difference in kind between a one minute old fertilized egg, a four week old fertilized egg, a four year old fertilized egg, a 40 year old fertilized egg? Answer is simple, no. There is no difference in kind. There is simply a difference in degree of maturity. At one minute old, that fertilized egg is at the appropriate stage for a one minute old fertilized egg. At four weeks, that fertilized egg is at the appropriate stage of development for a four week old fertilized egg. At four years of age, that fertilized egg is at the appropriate stage of maturity for a four year old fertilized egg and the same for a 40 year old fertilized egg. 100 times out of 100, that fertilized egg passes down a woman's birth canal as a human being, never as an alligator, never as a chicken, never as a bull or a cow. 100 times out of 100 as a human life. That is why I stand strongly against abortion, because I'm convinced that's a human life that we're dealing with. But in the same breath that I stand against abortion, I have to stand for adoption. In the same breath that I stand against abortion, I have to be willing to dish out money to support those people who bring children into the world and are not financially capable of handling that. And in the same time that I stand against abortion, I have to point out that Jesus Christ bled and died on a cross to forgive those of us who've had abortions, to forgive those of us who put a woman in a position where she had to consider an abortion. So Jesus Christ offers all of us forgiveness and hope. And there's no sin too big or too bad or too gross for Jesus to forgive us. An evolutionist who says that, who uses the eternity of matter or the fact that matter is eternal as their basis for the origin of life. Okay, good question. What do I say to the evolutionist who says, matter and energy are eternal, therefore we don't need any God, and that's just how we came about. What I say to that person is, my experience of life contradicts your worldview, and I'll bet anything your experience of life contradicts your worldview. My experience of life teaches me we can really love. And I have never once seen a pound of love. Love is not matter and energy. Love is a value that we as human beings can experience or we can choose not to experience. Second point. I experience free will, and I'm so convinced that you have free will that if you smack him in the face next to you, I'm going to hold you responsible. I'm going to say, hey, Jack, don't do that again. That's not good. In other words, I'm convinced you have free will. Now, the only way that love can be real, the only way free will can be real, is if there's more to reality than just matter and energy. See, if all of reality is matter and energy, then love is just a biological drive. Free will is just a biochemical reaction in your brain. And my point is, yes, obviously the biochemical reactions are real, but there is more to you, there's more to me, than simply a complex biochemical reaction. There is such a thing as love, which is a free decision to work for the well-being of someone else. Why does Mother Teresa work among the dying in Calcutta, India? I'm convinced it's because she loves people. It's not financially profitable, and it's not motivated by a drive to preserve the genetic pool. That's not why Mother Teresa works among the dying in Calcutta, India. Is that love a chemical reaction? And my point is no. My point is it's a free decision. I would argue Mother Teresa could walk away from Calcutta. She doesn't have to stay working among the dying there. She could walk away today. Now, you see, the existence of free will says that there's a me that in spite of my sex drive to date rape a woman, I can choose not to date rape her. That is why if you date rape a woman, and I ask you why'd you do it, if you say to me, I had to do it, the biochemical reactions in my body program me to date rape my woman, my date. I'm gonna look you in the face and say, I'm sorry, I don't accept that view of reality. There's a you, a free will, that goes beyond your sex drive. 
And you have the ability to say, no, I refuse to date rape, even though I might want to date rape. And that's why I hold the, hold the rapist responsible for what he does. But you see, if there is no God, then what are you? All you are is matter and energy, a complex biochemical reaction, which means you're not free. You just do what your biochemical reactions program you to do. And that's why I respect B.F. Skinner and the Behaviorist School of Psychology. They're consistent. They say, all of reality is matter and energy. Therefore, there's no me, there's no you. They're simply complex biochemical reactions. And you do what you do because you're programmed to. You don't have any free will. And I'm saying rubbish. I'm saying my experience tells me there's more to me than just my drives, my urges. There's a me with a will that can say, I feel like blowing this guy out of the water. But instead of blowing him out of the water, I'm going to love him. I feel like hating my enemy. But instead of hating my enemy, I'm going to love my enemy. It's not easy. I feel like hating him, but I'm going to choose to love him instead. See, that's what Jesus meant when he said, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You're not a slave of your environment. You're not a slave of your genetic code. You have the ability to love even your enemy. Yes, sir. What if neuroscience can scientifically and mechanistically explain or describe what you're this apparent emotion called love in purely mechanistic terms and quantitatively? Fine. My point is, you dissect the brain, you chemically analyze the brain, you chemically analyze all the neurotransmitters, and you still don't have not told the whole story. I would insist there is an invisible you, a soul, a personality that goes beyond the biochemical write-up. And the reason I believe that is because I experience free will. And I know you do as well. That's right. You don't have to believe in God to experience free will. You're a human being created in his image. But I does not mean that it has some material origin. No, 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 no. Every atheist has free will. My point to the atheist is your experience of life contradicts what you believe. If you're an atheist and you say there is no God, then you have no basis for understanding free will. Because if you're an atheist, reality is matter and energy. That's what this guy was saying. Reality is matter and energy. So there's no me that goes beyond my chemical reactions. They're just chemical reactions. The things you do affect the rate at some levels that neurotransmitters are transmitted in those biochemical reactions. Fine. Then the reason I rape a woman is because neurotransmitters. So don't hold me responsible. It was a biochemical reaction. That's why I raped her. And my point is, Hogwash. I think you got a bit of that in Texas. Hogwash. My point is, you could have controlled those chemical reactions in your body. You did not have to rape her. To some level, they can't be controlled, and that you have to take uh, drugs in order to do that. It forms a psychotherapy. Exactly. Good point. Obviously, we're not just a soul. Obviously, we have a body. We have neurotransmitters. Obviously, we have biochemical reactions in our brains. Obviously. And obviously, we can alter those biochemical reactions by taking medicine. And that's and what good. I'm saying is that's not the only way to alter them. There's different levels of, of reactions, some that are controllable and some that are not. For instance, it's my belief that when Mother Teresa does help the dying in India, that causes the release of neurotransmitters to bring about that emotion that we call love, quote unquote, and it makes her feel good. And when she does that, she experiences that emotion. So he does, she does it over and over. It's not because of, of some spiritual thing, it's because it causes those chemicals to be released in the proper proportions within her nervous system. Okay, and my point is that Mother Teresa is not working among the dying in Calcutta, India, because of certain releases of chemicals in her body. Because obviously Mother Teresa, although she might have those chemical releases that make her feel good, she obviously has gone through an awful lot of suffering and deprivation to help people. So I would argue she has made a decision of the will freely. She has chosen of her own will 
to love destitute, dying people. And that's why she has sacrificed as much as she has. And she would tell you the same thing if she were here. Yes, sir. Thank you. I think, and I, I don't know for certain about this, but I think it's quite possible that sometime recent in evolutionary time, free will evolved alongside consciousness and the higher emotions as a mechanism to allow greater survival. As the human species became more of a social, social species, it probably became necessary to have this feeling free will. And I'm not saying I know that for certain. Free will is a very compelling feeling for everyone, uh, with, with the exception of a few limited uh, brain damage cases. Most people have free will. And I don't think that it's necessary to say that there must be some God just because I have this compelling feeling. I mean, we can take away someone's free will by uh, damaging a certain part of the brain right about here. We can take away free will by the administration of certain drugs. And you could say that that's just limiting the shell within which this soul resides. But I don't think you need to even imagine that there is this soul. Now, you've made the point that if you say you don't really have free will, if it is an illusion, then you don't have responsibility. You can't accept responsibility for your actions. I say that's ludicrous. Whether or not you have free will, you must accept responsibility for your actions. Otherwise, the results are as, as you indicated. No one will be able to accept responsibility and they'll be uh, writing it all off to biochemical reactions. Now, as we know, that's ludicrous. You can't say, oh, well, look, there were these levels of blah, blah, blah in my brain. Uh, I had to do it. And just like you can't say, oh, I'm sorry, the devil made me do it or God made me do it. You can't say these things and get away with it you, if, you're, if you're going to live in a just society, people have to be responsible for their own actions, whether or not we can prove on paper that there is a free will. Now, I'd like to make a second point. You can respond to this one also. Yesterday, you used the argument by design to say that there must be an intelligent, conscious designer behind the order in the universe. I'd like to make the point that you, if you look at something like a building or a wristwatch or an airplane, if you want to know about those things, you go to an expert. You go to an airplane designer and you say, how are these things designed? If you want to know about a wristwatch, you go to a watchmaker. You say, this has your name on it. How did you design this? How, uh, how does it work? If you look at the universe, it's a completely different thing from any man-made object. You have to get expert opinion. You can't rely if you want the truth. You cannot rely on your everyday experience and expect to have the truth. You must go to experts, cosmologists, astronomers, biochemists. You must ask them, how does this thing work? How could it have come into being? Now, whether or not there was a first cause that's divine, I don't think any of us will ever know, certainly. If you have revealed knowledge that tells you there's a divine origin for the Big Bang, that's fine. Good for you. But I don't think you should impose that view on anyone else. I have not imposed my views on anybody. And I think it's a really wimpish idea to accuse me of imposing my ideas on anybody. If you can't be a man and stand there and express yourself and me listen to you and then me express myself and you stand there and listen to you, if you have to accuse me or anybody else of imposing their ideas on you because they happen to disagree with you, that is a very cowardly, wimpish, non-rational position to assume. You have every right to state your opinion, and I have every right to state my opinion. And for you to use the word impose is rude. It's rude and it's narrow-minded. It's really narrow-minded. This man disagrees with me. I respect his right to disagree with me. Because he disagrees with me, he's not imposing his views on me. Grow up. Be adults. Realize that he can say what he wants to say, I can say what I want to say, and we're not imposing our views on each other. We're having a rational dialogue.